right, and hello. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, building real-time analytics applications the easy way. Um, so this is about Apache Druid. Uh, just first show of hands. Anybody heard of Apache Druid? OK, we have a few. This is good. Um, so uh, well, first, who am I? I'm Sergio Ferragut. I work for Imply as a senior developer advocate uh, for Apache Druid. This means I promote the Apache Druid project, and I help uh, people implement the Apache Druid project uh, in open source. Um, Imply, as a company, contributes to the, the Apache Druid project, and we have our own products around uh, Apache Druid. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is an overview of what Apache Druid is. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what Kubernetes is and what Helm charts are. Um, because Apache Druid is hard. It's a, we'll see the architecture, and, and it's hard to implement it unless you use uh, something to help you orchestrate it. And Kubernetes and Helm charts help. Um, so we'll go into the Apache Druid open source project's Helm chart. It has a Helm chart of its own. We'll go into an overview of the Helm chart, how you can use it to scale uh, the uh, cluster up and down, how to use auto scaling for ingestion, and the things that are missing from the Helm chart where we want help from other developers to uh, get involved in the project and, and improve it. Um, so what is Apache Druid? It's a database. It's a database uh, that is fully scalable, uh, both for ingestion and for query. Um, it deals with both batch and real-time data. Um, it uh, provides ad hoc statistical analysis across any dimensions that you put in the data. And it provides low latency delivery in real-time events and uh, really fast response times to queries. So uh, what is a real-time analytics application? This is uh, an example of a real-time analytics application, but it has a few characteristics. Uh, first of all, it's very fast queries. That's uh, sort of the, 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 the key differentiator for Apache Druid. Uh, it does this on fresh data, so on streaming real-time data, as well as historic data. And that's sort of its unique uh, characteristic, that it has both real-time analytics and historic analytics in the same, uh, in the same query. Uh, it provides high concurrency because it has these fast queries. It helps uh, uh, drive high concurrency. And it's meant to drive a highly interactive uh, conversation with the data. So uh, one thing I'd like to point out about these videos is this is an example of an application. This, uh, the, the database behind this application is Apache Druid. Uh, this is actually one of the products that uh, we sell. It's called uh, Implied Pivot. Um, which is a visualization tool that allows you to navigate the data a lot like Tableau, if you're familiar with Tableau. Um, but these uh, videos are not accelerated. This is the real time. This is videos in real time, so you can see the interaction that it that it provides, right? Where you can uh, do filtering, uh, uh, sort by a different dimension, uh, split the data by a different dimension, do drill in, drill out, that kind of uh, operations with that response time, with that that speed. So. Uh, how does it do this, right? And so let's talk about the architecture of Druid. So at the high level, uh, Apache Druid uh, is deployed in three different sets of, or kinds of nodes, uh, the query services that provide access to uh, the cluster for, for users, where you submit queries, where you submit ingestion tasks. Uh, the data services, which is the main um, scalability uh, of the uh, of the process, where it uh, provides scale for ingestion and for query, and we'll talk more in detail about that. And the master services, which control the operation of the whole cluster. Additionally, it has a dependency on external storage and uh, what we call deep storage, and we'll talk a little bit about how that works. Uh, this could be any distributed file system like HDFS or object stores like S3. So uh, let's talk about data ingestion, which is one of the main processes <clears throat> that uh, Apache Druid uh, provides. So in uh, ingestion, there's a subset of these microservices that are involved. Right? There's the router on the query service side. There's the middle managers, which manage the ingestion process. And the overlord, which controls the overall ingestion process and tells the middle managers what to do. So how does this work? Um, first, it starts at the router where uh, you use REST APIs or the user interface that the, it provides as a web uh, application 
to submit a, an ingestion request. Uh, that the router's job, as its name indicates, is to route the request to the appropriate microservice in the whole cluster. So in this case, if it's an ingestion, it routes it to the overlord. The overlord plans the ingestion. This means splitting up the work among all the available middle managers that actually do the ingestion and submits those uh, subtasks to the middle managers. The middle managers then uh, do what they're told, right? They, they either connect to a subset of partitions in Kafka or Kinesis to do real-time ingestion or connect to some source of batch files to ingest those batch files. And they produce something called these little squares that we see uh, uh, moving from the mill managers to deep storage are a particular data structure that Druid uses that's a columnar data structure. That, uh, that So the middle managers ingest the data if it's real time, if it's streaming data, it keeps it in memory, and we'll go a little bit into why that's important uh, when we get to the query side. Um, and it builds these uh, segment files. These are immutable files that uh, once they, they're built, it's a columnar structure that's pre-indexed for all of the dimensions, and it pushes them into deep storage for persistence, for long-term persistence. In, in the batch case, it also does the same thing, except that it's not keeping the data in memory. These also scale, right? So if you have more throughput in your event, uh, in your Kafka streams, you can just add more middle managers. The overlord recognizes that there are more middle managers and it uses the capacity to do uh, faster ingestion or more throughput. Um, so uh, then uh, the other main process that occurs is the uh, data management process. What happens here is the coordinator, another one of the master processes, recognizes all of the ingestion that has occurred. So it, it knows about all of the segment files, these immutable files that exist in deep storage for any given table, and it distributes them across historicals. The historicals are used for querying the historical data. So it distributes them, creates copies of them across historicals, both for parallelism, so to execute queries in parallel, and for high availability. So you choose how many replicas you want. What's happening here is the queries don't access the data directly from deep storage. The coordinator tells the historicals to preload uh, the data into its local storage, so the historicals have local storage, so that it can query them faster. And it also caches them in memory within the historicals to provide high, you know, the performance that uh, Druid is known for. So on the query side, uh, so we've loaded uh, into the historicals, the historical segments, uh, the, the real-time streamings are in memory within the middle managers. So when a query uh, comes in, so again, through the router, uh, you submit queries either through the REST API or through a user interface or through JDBC. Um, and the query is submitted to one of the brokers. So you can have many brokers. Uh, this also provides you know, higher concurrency if you have lots of queries uh, running. So it distributes the queries am uh, among the brokers. The broker plans the execution of the query. And it knows also which portion of the data is, in, is real time. So which portion is in memory inside the middle managers and which portions of the data are in the historicals. So it submits uh, individual subtasks to each of these middle managers or to the historicals to resolve the queries. Um, and so this is how it delivers both on real time, uh, the, 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 the portion of time that you're, you're consuming in real time, and the portions of the data that have already been consumed and put into the historicals. So uh, Kubernetes, why Kubernetes? So Kubernetes, uh, I'm assuming everybody knows Kubernetes. Hands, Kubernetes. Well, most. Okay. So Kubernetes orchestrates the operation of a of a cluster, right, or of of applications in general, of services, um, and deploying on Kubernetes makes managing Druid much easier, and it provides other benefits, which we'll go through in a minute. So it provides the uh, acquisition and management of nodes. So it, it uh, acquires or it has a set of resources, different node types with different CPU and memory characteristics. Um, so it knows what resources it has available. It accepts object requests. This is you know, the deployment of an application, the deployment of a service, the deployment of, of, uh, of stateful sets or, or non-stateful sets or deployments in general. 
Um, and it instantiates, based on what you request, it instantiates containers to deliver on those services or to deliver, uh, to deliver the application functionality in general. It also monitors the, these containers, so it provides high availability from that perspective. So if there's a failure on any of the containers, it restarts it and manages the restartability and the high availability of the application. Um, these two examples are two different kinds of deployments, right? In the first one, we have a, a development system where we put all of the containers in a single node, so it's not a highly available configuration, but you can decide whether to configure you know, a test dev environment that's a small environment or a larger environment that has you know, the replication of different processes, providing high availability, and across multiple nodes, providing parallelism and, and more performance. So um, why Apache Druid on Kubernetes? So I've mentioned a few of these things. It provides high availability and recovery. It's monitoring each of the containers and restarts them when necessary. It provides anti-affinity. This is the idea that uh, you don't want two containers to run on the same node if they're of the same type. You want them running on separate nodes and even uh, across different availability zones, as an example, so that uh, you uh, if you have a failure, it doesn't, uh, you've, only one thing is failing at a time, right? Um, or you can have even more, you can have replication factors that are larger and therefore lose more than one uh, element at a time. But anti-affinity gives you that capability of distributing a particular set of containers across different nodes. It also provides persistent storage um, for the historicals in particular. Because, uh, like I mentioned, historicals load data to their local to their local cache, and uh, in normal implementations outside of Kubernetes, what this means is if if you lose one of these nodes, you have to restart it, and if you don't have the storage that the, the segment data already in the local storage, you have to reload them from from uh, S3 or from HDFS. That takes time, so Kubernetes helps there by allowing, uh, giving it persistent storage, so it restarts a container, brings it uh, along with its persistent storage, so the recovery of a historical is way faster. It also provides scalability. You can easily manage increasing or decreasing the scale of a deployment of any of the ingestion portion or of the uh, historical portion. It provides auto-scaling for the ingestion specifically, and we'll talk about that a little more. Um, provides security, it provides encryption, it provides uh, control, access control, ingress control, and network isolation. And it uh, automates the process of upgrading. Uh, it uh, allows you to uh, do rolling upgrades such that uh, during an upgrade process, the system is available. Helm chart. So all of everything we've talked about in Kubernetes is... Uh, Sometimes hard, right? Because you have to define a lot of uh, all of the objects uh, yourself, and you have to define you know, the characteristics of the service, the characteristics of the deployments, and so forth. And those are sometimes complex uh, structures that you need to build. So uh, what Helm charts do is predefine those, predefine dependencies. In this case, the Apache Druid Helm chart has dependencies on Zookeeper and on a metadata database, which normally is Postgres or MySQL. It can be others, so you can configure it to be other databases, but those are the ones that uh, are included in the Helm chart. Um, and then it defines templates for each of the services, uh, for the, each of the ones that we talked about, the historical, the broker, the middle manager, et cetera. These templates are the definition of the Kubernetes objects that you need to deploy each of these microservices. And finally, it provides a values.yaml. This is the list of parameters that control the deployment. And it comes with defaults, with default values. So when you're deploying um, a, a, particular, uh, a particular cluster, all you need to do is override those parameters that you want to change uh, in your own values file. And it will use all of the defaults plus the overrides that you provided, right? So in the you can deploy a uh, a ten uh, historical node uh, and uh, six historical I mean six middle managers by simply replacing the replica counts of those two elements. So it makes it really e Helm charts make it really easy to deploy things. So. Uh, what I'm talking about next is what the uh, those objects are, what those templates look like inside the Helm chart. Right? Uh, 
So for the router, broker, overlord, and coordinator, it uses a simple deployment. This is a, a stateless uh, configuration of, uh, of these services, which means it doesn't matter uh, what the names of those containers are, or they don't have state, so the, the storage doesn't need to be persisted. So it just manages the a set of these containers and monitors them and restarts them. Uh, it provides an ingress, which is really only necessary in, uh, in Druid for the router. So mostly, uh, while you, all of the services have REST APIs that you can access directly, but uh, in a normal deployment, you're only accessing through the router. So the router is the one you usually enable for ingress. And it provides the, the uh, service definition, which uh, provides a local, uh, I mean, a logical uh, network name, right? A logical host name that, you, that allows you to access the service uh, across the cluster. The middle manager is a little more interesting, right? This is where the ingestion occurs and when the, where the real-time queries occur. Yeah, this is deployed as a stateful set. Uh, it's a stateful set because it uses uh, local uh, storage to do intermediate uh, files. So as it's ingesting in real time, it writes locally to do checkpointing as it's, uh, as it's consuming the data. Um, it also has a pod uh, disruption budget. This is what controls the uh, upgrade, the rolling upgrade, and it tells uh, uh, Kubernetes how many nodes to upgrade at a time, so how many to bring down and, uh, at a time and replace with a new version. Um, usually that's set to one, but you could set it higher if you have uh, higher replica counts for the data. Um, it provides uh, the service as well. The, the logical service has the middle manager, the ingestion capability as a, as a logical service, a logical name. Um, and in this case, the middle manager comes with an optional horizontal pod autoscaler. Um, this uh, allows you, and we'll look at the details in a second, but uh, it allows you to configure how small or how big the uh, deployment of this service can get and when it should grow, what, what uh, thresholds uh, will trigger it to grow, what thresholds will trigger it to shrink. Um, the historicals are very similar. They also are stateful. In this case, it's particularly important, like I mentioned before, because we have the, the, the segment files that are stored locally on the, on the historicals that uh, would need to be reloaded if uh, they're not there when it restarts. So Kubernetes here provides this very fast recovery by uh, giving it the uh, the permanent, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, persistent volume um, uh, to recover quickly. It also uses the same pod disruption budget as the uh, as the middle managers to do the rolling upgrade, provides a service, and in this case, it's not a good idea to do automatic auto scaling because in the historical case, it has these uh, this local cache of segment files that. Uh, will be distributed automatically when you grow the, the platform. So if you add more historicals, the coordinator recognizes that there are more historicals, and it redistributes the segment across whatever number of historicals you have. So if you were automatically scaling up and down, that causes an additional workload to be moving the segments around. That's not really necessary. Uh, so usually the historical scaling is done manually. So this is an example of what it takes to deploy using the Helm chart, right? And it's actually fairly simple for a simple uh, deployment, for a test dev deployment. It really is just, uh, you know, th this starts from cloning the repository, the open source repository, uh, and then it's really just two commands. It's the Helm dependency update, which brings in the, uh, the Helm chart for Zookeeper and for Postgres. And uh, then it's just an install command that will deploy a, the simple cluster, right? In the simplest case, it, uh, you can see here, it's a, it uses a single historical, a single middle manager, the Postgres, a single coordinator. So it's a test dev uh, deployment in this case. If you want to do more complex uh, deployments, then you need to configure the, the values uh, YAML. And I'll, I'll walk through a few of these. So the first thing you need to configure is the deep storage, what you're going to use as the permanent repository for the segment files. Typically, this is S3. In some cases, it's HDFS. It also has the option of doing it locally, which means on local disk. But that only works if you're in a test dev environment on your laptop or something of that nature where it's, everything is, uh, is using the same storage. 
Um, you also have to define the, the metadata database that you're going to use for where it stores the definition of the tables, the definition of which uh, segments have been loaded to each of these tables and where they're distributed across the, across the cluster. Um, so you can use the in the Helm chart, like I said, you have Postgres or MySQL as the options for this. But you can actually point this at whatever you want. You, know, you can point it at a Redis service or at the, some other uh, cloud-provided uh, database or other uh, deployments within your Kubernetes of other databases if you want. The, um, my animation's a little wrong there. Um, the other important thing to do across all of these services, define the resources. The resources that you want each of these services to have in terms of CPU and memory. Um, this is a bit of a science to, to figure out uh, for, depending on the workload that you want to do. Um, but uh, so this is where you decide how many, how much CPU you're uh, allotting for each of the middle managers or each of the historicals, and a lot depends on the workload that you're trying to achieve. Right, the amount of ingestion, the throughput that you have in Kafka will require more memory and more CPU in the middle managers. Uh, larger, uh, larger sets of data in the historicals will require more storage and potentially more processing to do faster or, or more threads in, in, a, in a particular historical. So anyway, you need to think about this and a great resource for this is this link I provided there, uh, basic cluster tuning, which describes each of the services and how you want to configure them in terms of CPU and memory um, allotment for each of the services. So um, in, the, in the router's case, uh, you'll want to, at least in a high availability configuration, you'll want to at least have a replica count of two for high availability. Um, and this is where you will want to enable the ingress, right? because this is really where all access from the users occurs. In the overlord and coordinator, you at least need a replica count of two for high availability. So that uh, those are important in uh, real cluster configuration. Um, in the middle managers, again, you'll want a replica count of two at a minimum. This is where you probably want more than two if you want a real deployment. Um, so this is where, the way I think about this is if you're going to lose one of your resources for ingestion in this case, which is what the middle managers do, um, if you only have two, you're going to lose 50% of your, of your capacity if you lose one of them. So you'll probably want more, even if you assign less CPU and less memory to e each one of them, just so that when you lose one, you're not losing a lot of uh, ingestion capacity. You'll also want to configure some other parameters. I didn't go into all of the details here, but again, in the uh, documentation, you can see which parameters control how much work these, uh, each of these services is doing. So there's a set of parameters like those, the Druid indexer uh, running parameters and the Druid indexer fork parameters, which control uh, the spawning of other JVMs within the middle manager that actually do the work of ingesting from a particular set of partitions or for a particular set of files. So you want to size those as well. And th all of those are parameters within the uh, Helm chart. Another thing you'll want to do in, in the high availability case is uh, provide task replicas. So what happens here in, in the real-time ingestion is we're bringing in data directly from Kafka and consuming from Kafka. And if you just have one task dedicated to each set of partitions and that one fails, you're going to have to replay. So this, this has two effects because there's data in memory here. And when you're querying that real-time data, you're querying a set of rows that you've consumed from Kafka. And if there's a failure, it's going to restart. So if there's queries coming in on that real-time portion, and you're doing counts, for example, or sums or whatever, you'll see that the sum is growing over time from the in-memory portion. And if it fails and it restarts, suddenly the counts go down, the sums go down. So you want to avoid that. And uh, Druid provides a way of avoiding that by where, uh, defining uh, your ingestion process with replica tasks. This means that you're doing double the work, right? So you're, you're ingesting from the same set of partitions on two different middle managers. And so the red ones are the same set of data. The green ones there are also the same set of, da of data. Um, and what happens is uh, as soon as one of them completes the time frame that uh, it's consuming from, the other one will be discarded. But if there's a failure in between, 
The other one keeps going, and the other one keeps responding to queries. So this is how you really provide high availability of the real-time ingestion. Um, also, if you want to scale it, you can scale it manually. So by increasing the, the number of, uh, of middle managers, that automatically scales the capacity of ingestion and therefore can deal with larger uh, throughput in the, in the streaming. This can also be done automatically uh, by using the auto-scaling uh, definition inside the, uh, the Helm chart. Uh, when you enable it, you define the minimum size, the maximum size, so the minimum number of middle managers, the maximum number of middle managers, and which metrics, which memory or CPU consumption metrics and the thresholds that will trigger the growth of uh, so more replicas or less replicas. So Kubernetes will manage it automatically. It'll increase the number of uh, containers as the workload grows or decrease it as the workload subsides. In the historical case, again, we want a minimum of two. Same kind of uh, problem around parallelism, right? So if you, you usually want more than two because if you lose one, you'll have 50% of the capacity. Same thing as in the middle managers, right? So you'll want the, you want to think about this, how much, how much capacity you want to lose in the case of a failure. And um, even though uh, Kubernetes will bring it back fast, there will be a period of time where you, where you have a loss of, uh, of capacity. So you want to minimize that. This is where you also want to define anti-affinity because you don't want two historicals running on the same node and you'll want to define node selectors. This is the, uh, the characteristics of the physical nodes and CPU memory configurations of physical nodes or virtual nodes, I guess, um, that, uh, that you want the historicals to run on. So it'll select a particular kind of node among the nodes that are available to Kubernetes. And you definitely want to do that both in the historicals and middle managers. Um, the broker, uh, you probably want, I don't know why I said three, you need at least two um, to, for high availability. The anti-affinity is also important here for high availability and the node selector because the brokers are actually involved in, in the queries. So you want them to have uh, significant resources if you have you know, more concurrency. This gives you, a, a, you know, this is where you control um, the, the, the uh, concurrency capability and parts of the queries because parts of the queries are actually resolved in the broker uh, as it receives the result, the intermediate, the subsets of results from middle managers and historicals. It has to put them together and do final aggregations. So they, they require some significant power as well. So summarizing, I think I went really fast. What's my time so far? <laughs> I'm almost done. <laughs> All right, good. Um, so uh, summarizing, Apache Druid is a real-time OLAP database. So it provides you know, slicing and dicing uh, with really uh, fast response times. Uh, Kubernetes makes this uh, better because it provides higher availability for a, a uh, deployment than you would otherwise, um, it, which gives us better uh, recovery times, better recovery points in the case of failures. Uh, it also provides the auto scaling of the ingestion capability and the real time query capability. Um, so it'll increase and decrease, uh, like we said, uh, based on the workload that you're throwing at it. Um, the Helm install makes it really easy to deploy new uh, new clusters. Uh, what we see is people defining uh, different sets of uh, values that are the overrides to the to the normal parameters or default parameters. So you have things like you know a minimum cluster for development, a QA cluster, and you have those predefined so you can deploy as many of these clusters as you want fairly easily by just doing a, a Helm install command. And finally, it allows you to do by using Helm diff and Helm upgrade commands, it allows you to change the configuration live so you can manually increase the, uh, the characteristics, even the resources allotted to each of the, uh, each of the containers or the number of containers that you're using. And you can do that live by using the uh, Helm upgrade capabilities as well as upgrading the software itself by changing a tag that defines the version of the software. It will automatically go through the rolling upgrade process. So what doesn't it do yet? Um, so Druid has uh, other capabilities that are not uh, integrated into the Helm chart yet. And this is where we want more people involved in the community. This is a great uh, conference to recruit uh, developers. So I'm hoping that we get uh, some more uh, committers to the project. Um, 
And uh, the, the, one of the things that's missing is the metrics configuration. This is the ability that Druid has to emit metrics about the resource utilization across the board. How much CPU and memory it's using for each query, what are the resource utilization overall through the cluster, so that you can understand what's going on in the cluster and optimize it, increase the resources where you need to, and so forth. Um, so these metrics are, are interesting to have, but they're not part of the Helm chart yet. So adding the, uh, con that to the configuration would be useful. Also the multi-tiering configuration. So historicals can be configured in sets of historicals. They don't have to be like one cluster. You can have like multiple sub-clusters, as you could call them, of historicals that deal with different portions of the data. So we have the real-time data is going in the middle managers, and then it goes into historicals, but you could have things like a one week of data in really fast hardware, like fast CPUs, lots of memory, SSDs to, to, for the local storage, which will make the query fast in the one week of the latest data, and then have another set of uh, historicals deal with uh, the uh, you know, two years of history or whatever goes beyond that. Uh, Druid will automatically, you can define the rules that tell you one week uh, of data in the, in the fast tier and the rest of it in the slow tier, and Druid will automatically move segments from uh, the fast tier to the slower tier, and uh, this is missing from the Helm chart, so this is something that uh, we want to add. And finally, like I said, uh, well, you're invited. Uh, you know, you can fork the repo. Just go to uh, GitHub for to the Apache Druid uh, URL that I have there. Uh, make changes and submit your PRs. And we're not just looking for developers, right? Uh, for people to actually commit changes to the software. We're also looking for users and users who report bugs as part of the, uh, of the project or have uh, requests for new enhancements. So, or improve the documentation, right? Yeah, we, we were always looking to make the documentation better. So it's all about that, right? It's not just the uh, actual development of the software. So I'll just leave you with a, a bunch of ways of contacting us and uh, or, or interacting with us. We have a Slack channel. We have a, the uh, Druid user forum, druidforum.org, where it's a Q&A environment. It has blog posts. Um, but one that I like to point out particularly is our training program, learn.imply.io. If you're interested in learning more about Druid and getting your hands on it, these are hands-on courses that are free right now. So if you go to that website, you'll have a basics course, the Druid Basics, which helps you configure the, uh, the basics of configuration, walks you through it and how to use it. Um, and then a more advanced course uh, about modeling and ingestion that's also available there. So anyway, with that, I'll uh, open it up for questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So we are right on time. We have uh, seven minutes for the questions, so that's super. Uh, who will start? Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I just have two quick questions. Uh, what does the query language look like? Is it just standard SQL or? It is standard SQL. I won't say it covers all of SQL, but yes, it's a SQL. All right, and is there a uh, plugin for Grafana? I'm sorry. Is there a plugin for Grafana to support Apache Druid? So one of the really interesting things about this project, it has uh, core extensions that are uh, part of the Druid project and also community extensions. And yes, there are extensions for Grafana that have been built. So there are the metrics emitters are, uh, it's not in the help chart yet, but there are extensions where you can uh, emit to things like InfluxDB and hook up uh, Grafana to it for sure. All right, thanks. Yes. Someone else? Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions too. So one, sure. uh, around the coordinator, you said that there is, um, you know, it takes care of uh, berry balancing and, you know, uh, the segments across the historical set you have. Do you also support some kind of heat-based re rebalancing or it's primarily the, based on the segment sizes? I'm sorry, so what? Do you also support heat-based rebalancing based upon the heat of segments and the you know, kind of query workload? Or it is primarily based on you know, the segment sizes, I suppose? You, you called it heat, right? Yeah, so the heat. data temperature? Yeah, right. Okay, so, so that's where, where multi-tier configurations come in because uh, what we see is typically uh, the temperature of analytics is related to the recency of the data. So you can define uh, load and load rules as, as part of the historical uh, 
definitions and have multiple tiers that allow you to have you know faster uh, faster CPUs, more memory uh, in one tier or in SSDs maybe in that tier that allow you to do the the hotter data in the more expensive hardware and then the colder data in less expensive hardware. Which, uh, but it's really. Typical implementations are, are, you look for SLAs, right? You're looking for how fast you want X queries to respond, whether that's the hot queries in the, in the more recent data versus, uh, you know, how fast you want to respond in the uh, more historic data. So it's, it, it's usually related to that. You define your SLAs and you define how much money you want to put into each of the tiers, right, to make it cost efficient. Okay, and within the tier, it's mostly uh, size-based, uh, equal distribution, I guess. It's completely configurable, right? You, oh. you decide how much uh, storage you allot to each of the uh, each of the tiers, and what the uh, Druid does is it distributes the segments that are available across those tiers. Um, so you have to have enough space for the amount of data that you're dealing with in real time, or uh, how much data you're dealing with in a week, and how much data you have in two years, or however much history you have in the slower tier. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question which I had is around the uh, brokers, right? Because uh, a scaling broker could be typically a challenge because they are doing the heavy lifting of all the aggregations and then of all the queries uh, result that they are getting on. So uh, do you see, uh, do you have any recommendation on how to scale up and then can it be a single point of failure for the entire service? Like, how, how, what is the recommendation to deal so, with? Uh, um so the brokers are, are, are uh, an important part of a, the query path, right? Uh, so yes, there's scaling up a broker, giving uh, each broker more CPU, more memory to deal with you know, the, the types of queries that you're driving through it. Um, it, uh, it. It's not really a single point of failure because there are other brokers that will take it, but in a given query, it will fail, right? If, if, if the query that was assigned to one broker um, is you know halfway through the, the that broker fails the query will need to be resubmitted in order to uh, to grab a, another broker all right all right thank you do we have another question hey um thanks for your talk it was really good um thank you can you Talk about some exciting application, like pe ways people are using Druid that um, sure. you know, um, we might get inspiration. That might be from. a longer conversation, but yeah, uh, but yeah I'll, I'll throw a few examples. Uh, so, so Druid was born in the ad tech space, right? Uh, Druid was actually uh, developed within a different company uh, originally. It was the company's meta markets. So ad tech is one of the use cases, right? Uh, for And it's one of the u important use cases because it, it requires you to understand what's happening right now with your campaign, with your ads, and compare that to the history, right? So any use case where looking at what's happening in real time and compare, doing comparisons to history is a good use case. And we see use cases in fraud detection and in the finance space. We see Netflix is a, is a user. They, they monitor their streaming service. So they have events like uh, buffering events. They measure everything about how their users are, 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 are the user experience, right? Um, so, and they optimize and they constantly react to the, the lack, you know, to buffering events or to other events that, uh, that are providing a bad experience to their users. So it gives them the ability to react fast. It's also used in uh, network monitoring uh, services. Uh, uh, there's a bunch of use cases. We'll, we can have a longer conversation about that. In general, it's you know any use case that uh, needs fast response times or can use fast response times and uh, deals with both real time and historical data. Um, you know, that would be a really interesting question for our uh, CTO. I, I, I don't have any particular ones that surprised me so far, uh, but I'm still learning. Uh, we have the time for maybe one quick question. I guess that's it. <laughs> so really, thank you uh, for uh, no, thank this you. such a good presentation. Sorry. Thank you.